Anyways, um, uh, I'm Zadok again, uh, speaking to you guys from here in Transmar. The song you sang is a beautiful song to me, a very dear song to me. We are living in an age and time when men and women are espousing, desiring, and longing to be like some superstars some celebrities people longing even in the christian uh cycles in the church people long to be like certain preachers i have been in an experience where i looked forward to being like preacher x to preaching like preacher x to doing things like brother x and sisters trying to be like sisters. We are living in a crazy time. And the subject we are dealing with is very solemn, not only for youths, but even for adults. Uh, I happened to meet a brother last Sabbath as I was preaching uh, somewhere else. And he mentioned to me that these messages are equally important for the elderly and i did agree i did agree and so i want us to understand that we are living in serious times of this world's history and if there was ever time that god wanted us to be like his son jesus christ then probably this is the time so last time we were starting off with a story and an and experience that I shared with you about life experiences while I was younger than I am today. A youth, well, I know that according to the government of Kenya, I'm still a youth. And so uh, it's time um, the better place to speak to youth because I'm not very far from that bracket. Indeed, I want us to understand we were talking about the lusts of the flesh. And Paul, you are looking at Paul as the old man instructing Timothy, who was actually um, an evangelist. And Paul spoke to the young Timothy and told him, flee youthful lust. 2 Timothy 2 verse 22. That was the message of Paul to Timothy. I, I was reading today from 1 John chapter 2. And verses number 17, it says, The world passeth away, and the last thereof. But he that doeth the word of God abideth forever. And because this is a, a continuing a, um, a part of the series that we are looking into, into the messages that God wants the young people to have, it will be important that... Uh, uh, we have a connection between what we have been studying and what we are studying now. Now, uh, we're trying to prepare young people for the kingdom of God to be useful, to be men and women who can be perfect representation of the, the kingdom of heaven. Not a perfect representation of the world. Uh, <clears throat> Ellen White has a lot to say about the subject of courtship, the subject of marriage. And I wouldn't want to go straight into what she says before we build certain principles from the Word of God, which is the Bible, so that our people may know that it's a high calling, that God is calling us. Uh, as young people, so that we may be fully involved in the final work and also to have victory over sin. Because I want you to understand, every single one of us, that God wants us to have victory over sin. Nothing matters in the judgment if we do not come to a point where we have overcome sin. The perfection of Christian character has been one of the most challenged doctrines in the Christian realms. People uh, perhaps might not have as much 
no problem with other doctrines as they have with the doctrine perfection of Christian character. People want to be in the church doing the right thing, quote unquote, uh, believing the right doctrine. Uh, people want to be where they are acceptable by the majority, but people have a problem with the concept that if we are to start as part of the 140 and 4,000, we must remove every crease from our clothes. We must clean out every dirt. We must put on the white robe, the robe of righteousness. And it's not our robe. It's the robe of Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ that counts in the judgment. And young people, we are not excused. Now, last time we realized that what we put in our mind uh, through the gates of entrance of the eye, the mouth, uh, uh, the ear, what we touch, uh, whatever it is that our legs take us to, can actually, what we take in by eating through our mouth, can actually interfere with our frontal lobes, which is the citadel of making decisions, right judgment of spirituality. You realize with me that if we don't put our mind in the right position to accept spiritual things, then the things that we will be mentioning in regard to how we prepare to form families for Christ will not make sense to us. They will not make sense to us because spiritual things are spiritually designed. And that's why it's important for me to put the foundation of some of the things that are hindering the youth from understanding these spiritual things. And I'm lying together with you. So I'm trying as much as possible to be very kind as much as possible to be very courteous in these presentations. But I want you to understand, if we do not come to a point where we accept the mind of Jesus, because we want to be like Jesus, we accept the mind of Jesus, not the mind of man, not the ideas and concepts of man. I'm talking about the very mind of Jesus, the very ideas, the very concepts, the very will of Christ, the spirit and grace of Christ. We cannot accept spiritual things because spiritual things are spiritually designed. And that's why it's important for us to see these things through the scripture. And then we will see um, what happens as we deduce them from the scripture to what how the spiritual prophecy actually enumerate the experiences that youths have to have in order for them to stand and be dressed with the attire that is shown us in Ephesians chapter 6. Remember, I said last time, Ephesians chapter 5 gives us the ideal family. How a marriage experience ought to look like. Uh, for you can see there the church and Christ coming together, cleaving together, is actually typified or uh, is actually um, um, resembled by the union between a man and a woman. And, and then that love that Christ shows to this church in Ephesians chapter 5 is a gap in love. We'll talk about that. And we'll see how that love is so deep, how that love goes so deep beyond what you could call eros. That's why we have misunderstood the concept of love because we thought love is feeling. We thought that love is uh, being just enthusiastic about about intimacy and then that's why many young youths have reduced relationship to basically intimacy when that is just segment of what constitutes a marriage relationship i want you to understand that love is a principle and those who have not known what god did to humanity can never understand what it means to live with a woman under one roof or to live with a man under the same roof. Here we'll never understand that. Because remember last time we also said 
that marriage, which we found in the spirit of prophecy, that God has called Christian ministers to prepare youths to be responsible parents. So if you go to a church and you've been through a church and you have not been taught to be a responsible parent, a responsible woman, a responsible man, that church is not preparing you to stand because the family is where we perfect and demonstrate the image of Jesus Christ. Now that does not mean again that we, before we enter into a family relationship with a man and a wife, we are not to demonstrate. But remember, we will come all the way to the point that God created man and woman for the sake of angels. So that angels could understand the gospel in a very simple, uh, uh, um, a very simple way. Now, today, if, if, if you check through what, um, what rather we had um, uh, uh, broadcasted, as our subject today is, are you a strong man uh, slash woman? Who are you? Are you a strong man slash woman? And brothers and sisters, I want to read this in your hearing be before we go to what you want to study. Patrick's and Prophets, and that was page 567, paragraph 3. The real greatness of the man is measured by the power of the feelings that he can control. The real greatness of a man is measured by the power of the feelings that he can control, not by those that control him. Remember last time I told you my life in campus. I told you that I was a good choir member, for those of you who didn't know. I sang in the church choir. I sang in three serious uh, sub -choir. In the um, institution, uh, um, uh, I would sing good tenor uh, for your information if you didn't know. And at the same time, I graduated as a master guy. But I wondered why, in life, in our experience as quote unquote pious, respectable people, I mean, sometimes we would be uh, seen as the men who knew how to pray, who knew how to quote the Bible, who knew how to preach. And my question was, why don't this, that the church is seen in us, be seen amongst us in our life? Why is it not a real experience? And, and why was I saying that? Because I was seeing a different show from the church. I was seeing a different show from the members of the choir. I was seeing a different show from the members of the church leadership and church board. And then I realized that many people were struggling, but they covered that struggle with a curtain of some sort of spirituality. We are living in an aged time where I know that youths are struggling, where I know that marriages are struggling, where I know that people who men respect are struggling. I'll tell you, um, I have received concerns of people who are struggling recently, for example, with homosexuality. I have received concerns of people who are struggling with masturbation. I have received concerns with men who do not know what it means not to break, I mean, this idea of breaking hearts, jumping from one woman to another. And right here from this desk, I can tell you the truth. We are having a church full of wounds. We are having a world that is full of wounds. And why is this thing so? We want to ask ourselves that. Why is this thing so? I want us now to go to your Bibles and find what the Word of God says. And right now, I want you to go to the book of Judges, if you who. The book of Judges. We were there last time. And while we were talking about the book of Judges, we were reading the story of one man 
And this man's name was Samson, the son of Manoah. Let me give you a quick recap. Samson, the son of Manoah, was born one. His birth was announced by an angel. You remember that? Good. Just like the birth of a church was mentioned by an angel in Revelation chapter 10. But remember last time I said, I will not go to the prophetic aspect of the life of Samson as a typifies the system of uh, the system of um, seven day Adventist Adventism as being brought forth for a purpose. What? To deliver the Israelites from the bondage and captivity that the Philistines were putting them under. So the Israelites were in captivity. And then here is born a man who should be a deliverer of Israel out of captivity. His birth is announced by an angel, and the message is brought down by the same angel, instructing the mother, instructing the father of how he ought to live, how they ought to drink, what they ought to drink, and what they ought to live for a special movement for a special time with a special people that God has to announce for them how to live and that is why how we live is very important in regard to the decisions we make what we eat can interfere with the decisions we make what we listen to can interfere with the decisions we make but at the same time we can eat right we can listen right but we are still struggling why because we do not know the solutions to the struggles have i told you the story of a friend of mine he used to preach but he always confessed that sir i would preach i would go back home and pray but at the end of the day i would be into masturbation i mean what happens to a man who preached passionately what happened to a man who read his bible why wasn't he getting victory over this demon? You understand what I'm talking about? Why didn't he have interest in perhaps the opposite sex? We are living in a world that homosexuality is common to people. It's in the church. And we might say, oh no, it's not there. We don't agree with him. People are struggling. I want you to come to the reality. Marriage is not a bed of roses that you'd see it to be. That's the same way, while we think some things are only happening outside there, there are things happening in the church. Our youths are struggling. Some are struggling just to have a fiction for an opposite sex. And they don't know how to get out of it. And so here comes a man who is to be born and is born of a man and a woman, Manoah and the wife. And then he grows, and in the process of growing, he forgets his duty, his line of duty, the specifications that God gave to him. So instead of Samson being involved in doing what he was called to do, guess what Samson is doing? He's fighting lions, and that's a good thing. He's tying foxes together. That also an interesting show is cutting gates. And I've come to realize that sometimes we can come to a point where we are doing good works, but we forget our mission. We forget why we are in this world. And now I want us to, I said I'm not touching the prophetic aspect. I want to touch your life. Have you come to a point where you are doing a lot of good things, but you have forgotten the purpose of why you are born? All of us are born. In fact, let me say it this way. God created man and woman. We were brought into existence for one purpose, that we may reflect the perfect image of Jesus Christ. That character which had been misrepresented by Satan, about God the Father, we must now represent and show to the world that character. The final generation must produce a perfect image of Jesus Christ. But we can get caught up with the mechanics of 
caught up with the mechanics of what to do and what not to do. And many of us have been there, and it's not bad, it's good. But the youths in the church are caught up with music, and they are singing, and music is beautiful. If I heard what Brian was doing there, and what Elder Sidney and our sister Stacy, that was powerful. I tell you, I love music. I love listening to it, right? Uh, uh, um, but the concept is that um, we can get caught up with the mechanics of perhaps um, how to dress, and that's good. We have to dress as Christian women, and we talked about that. We have to eat like Christian women. We have to preach. We have to come to church on Sabbath. But why are our youth suffering while doing these things? That's the question. And so Samson was doing good things. Uh, it was a good show, carrying gates. I mean, it would be a demonstration. We have conquered. We, I mean, the Philistines can do nothing against us. You just thought that I was able to tear lions. I mean, how dare Philistines come against a man who can be able to bring a lion into pieces? How dare Philistines come against a man who can take the foxes and tie them by the... How dare, how dare they come against such a man? You understand, young people? But interesting enough, he forgot his mission, which was to prepare his mind so that he would be a man of firm principles. And so he began to break the strongholds of principles. You remember last time, I, I told you that no one finds himself in a bath. If you don't mind. No one finds himself in a bar taking four bottles of liquor. I told you I went into a bar in my life. No one believes that. Well, I sat in a bar in Dandora, in... Um, around Kayole, I lived in those areas. I would spend the whole night in a bar. I would drink about slightly over 10 bottles of Sprite. Slightly over 10 bottles. One day, a woman who happened to be a friend to one of my relatives with whom we used to go, uh, wanted to add liquor to my bottle, but my relative being concerned about my education, they wanted me to go to school. They said, no, you're not gonna, don't add him that. So God plucked me from, uh, from that experience, from that place, I didn't test liquor, I have, to, I have to confess. I have that testimony somewhere online. But the truth of the matter is, no one gets to a point where they drink 10 bottles of liquor. It begins by breaking the simple strongholds or principles. It begins by listening to that wrong music. It begins by entertaining that wrong movie. It begins by um, uh, uh, late hours, staying together with an opposite sex, for example, into late hours. Um, it begins by sometimes just uh, some form of jesting, a light speech. You are talking lightly and you forget that you, I'm not saying Christians shouldn't have light moments. Indeed, we should have uh, joyous moments. We should be happy. We should be glad. We should rejoice in the Lord of the West. But it does not mean that we are going to reduce ourselves into some sort of um, cheap talk. We are going to uh, fail to consider that this is a married woman and I'm a married man, or rather this is not a married woman and I'm a married man, I'm a minister. And then White says that if a young woman comes to me and begins being too fond of me or speaking cheaply without reserve, I should immediately repass that woman, even if it appears uncourteous. I went to preach somewhere, and Brian could remember. And as we were preaching, one old man told me, Zadok, don't you ever come back home late. And he told me, I told one great pastor about that. He refused. You see, that. The concept here was, 
I would decide not to listen to the old elder who was basically telling me, if you stay late, you are making yourself predisposed or being vulnerable to fall into temptation because he understood that sometimes someone can keep you long hours in a Bible study and the time comes when you forget that you are really doing a Bible study. You understand what I'm talking about? And you can be seated somewhere. I told you a story where we went to have a night. I don't know whether they called it vigil, but they called me. I was from preaching. And by 10, I saw Deaconesses dancing reggae and, 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 and or angla with, with the church leaders in the church. But I was like, God, what, what do you mean? It was happening. And that's why God calls us to fence actually to bring blocks and fill into those holes that can be loopholes that can lead us to break those strongholds of principles and so samson we are going to chapter 16 which is my interest samson goes down to timnath i've read about that and when he goes down to timnath listen to what he says this is where we left it last week when he goes down to Tim, now listen to what he says in Tim now, if you're with me in chapter number 16. The Bible says in 16, and verse 5 is what was broadcasted for us. Rather, uh, let's go back to chapter number four, uh, 14, rather, uh, first. Uh, chapter number 14 says in verses uh, uh, number 7, and he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. But you see, uh, uh, before that, uh, Samson says to the parent something in verse 3, the father and his mother, uh, 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 verse 2, and he came up and he told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistine. Now, therefore, get her for me. Why? Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all thy people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistine? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me. Get her for me, for she pleaseth me. So, listen to what Ellen White says, which is interesting. In the book Adventist Home, Verses chapter 55, uh, page 55, paragraph 3. The youth trust altogether too much on impulse. They should not give themselves away too easily, nor be captivated too readily by the winning exterior of the lover. Courtship as carried on in this age is a scheme of deception and hypocrisy with which the enemy of soul has far more to do than the Lord. Good common sense is needed here, if anywhere, but the fact is it has little to do. In fact, I want you to understand that if there is a place where common sense is never common, to 99.9% .9 of human beings in this world, it is in courtship. In courtship, our, sen our common sense is not common. All our senses are uncommon in this sense. I mean, uh, just a few people have that common sense. You look at the fact that uh, there are things that we become blind to in courtship. Uh, they say love is blind. Yes, infatuation is blind. Love is not blind because love is a principle. And that's why last time we talked about it and we said men and women who are godly rise to love. They don't fall in love. When you fall in love, it means you do not actually, one, pray, because those who fall in love don't use principles. Uh, 55 paragraph number three, sir. So those who actually fall in love don't 
gauge the principles that define love. And so when you fall in love, you are not a Christian. We make decisions. We pray about those decisions. We ask God if it is God's will. Now, I'm not going to say I'm that guy who has a perfect marriage, but I think I have a lovely wife and I have a lovely marriage. And I'm praying that God may help me and my wife to be more and more like Jesus. But I remember the first day that I met my wife in a physical meeting where we're talking about how to get married. And this time, it was in a park. It was in a park. And in that park, it was a public park. I'll not tell you where it is. That's a good place. So we went and we sat over this way. And then it's that place that I told her of my intentions. And then after that, we talked and talked. But in my mind, I found it a little bit difficult. I had to overcome because my mind was telling me what God's word is saying is not real. What God's word is saying is not real. Why? God's word is not telling us to fall in love. God's word is telling us to rise to love. We love because the principles of God's word calls us to love. And so we judge by those principles. Another difficulty was when I took off to go and see my mother-in-law. I took off to go and see my mother-in-law. It was a strange thing. I went alone and I sat down and the aunt to my wife was in the house on that day. And they cooked for me my best food. So I ate. And then when I'm done with eating, I'm here to talk to my mother-in-law to be if she accepts and perhaps if my wife to be would accept. Principles of God's word were constraining me. But the natural man, the natural Zadok was saying, ah, that, that's not right. It's, it's, it's not possible. It's, it's not possible to go and sit down and pray and talk about love issues. It is not possible. But I knew that if it is God's word, I can never be an example to any other youth in the future if I decide to trample upon what God is saying. Because I knew. At least on that one I knew. I know there were many other things that I didn't know better. But on this one, I knew what God was calling me into. And so friends of Jesus, Samson decides to tell the father and the mother, get me that woman. I don't care what you say about her. She's not circumcised. She's not an Israelite, but she pleases me. And so Samson was moved by passion. But remember, we just read our first quote from Patrick's and Prophets 5.67. And what did he say? The great, real greatness of a man is measured by the power of the feelings he can control. So Samson failed to control his feelings. First day. Instead of controlling his feelings and saying, well, it's true the woman is beautiful. She's the only work of God. And every person God has created is beautiful and wonderfully made. There is no woman who is ugly. There is no man who is ugly. All men are handsome. And all women are beautiful. And that is for sure true because they are the handiwork of God. And except we know there is a special woman whom God has made for you. There is a special woman that God has made for me. There's a special man that God has made for you. And there's a special woman that God has made for you friends of jesus if we cannot control passion then we are the weakest men in this world strength is not measured by the number of packs that a man has mm -hmm. strength is not measured by biceps 
and triceps. I would not have as big as you have. Strength is not measured by intellectual eloquence. A man who cannot control his passions is a weak man. He is a weak man. And so I'm here, brothers and sisters, to present to you, Samson, beginning to break the strongholds that God actually had raised, that he should live by, and by living by these things, he was going to fulfill his office work. And what was his office work? The office one called, and all of us, of course, have been called to fill different offices to be able to accomplish the work of preaching the three angels message. But if there is anything that the devil has actually known is going to hinder the preaching of the gospel, it is perhaps immorality, it's a perhaps youths who are loose, it's perhaps a life that is reckless, that condemns uh, the people who are otherwise been powerful. And last week we realized that the church is silent about these things. The church is not talking to the youths about what they need to be to see the woman. And we know that in the final phase, indeed, uh, the woman is brought to Samson. And uh, the woman is brought to Samson, and the story continues. Now, the second test comes. read the whole story for you and that woman dies uh, because of the experiences that you know after she, she actually well, Samson refuses to reveal the strength and you see Samson says no uh, Samson says no the first time he says, no, those who are in the world knows that if I insist just a little bit, I mean, pressing, I will press a little bit until the woman says, but uh, interest, Samson does not give the source of his strength. Uh, we know the Philistines come and he destroys the Philistines. Where we got our verse from? Samson then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an allot and went in unto her. I want to bring two stories together, uh, the story of Samson and the story of Joseph. Joseph does not go into the house of Potiphar by his own personal decision. On the contrary, Samson goes to Gaza by his personal decision. He simply feels that I am too strong to be deceived. I am the choir master, I am the preacher, so I can stay with these women and we can just story up to midnight, all right? After all, we are in a mission, or after all, we are preaching, or after all, we are men who are respected. Oh, we can chat. We can chat, or I'm an elder. I mean, I'm a pastor. People know that I preach. I'm glad also. What? It doesn't matter, so I can keep chatting with a woman just right in my office here and chat and chat and chat and chat. I'm, I'm ready yeah, nothing can happen. I can meet I can meet a woman by myself, perhaps here. And let me tell you, the devil is very crafty, and especially to the youth. And the greatest man of fallen on this one. Right? The greatest men in the Bible are fallen on this one. Morality. When Samson thinks that he's too strong, he's called of God, is a special guy. I mean, there is nothing Delilah can do to him. He began by uh, he began by uh 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 or did a new to um he feels like um uh, the thing is. I, I, I didn't know, all right? Thank you. So the concept is he thinks he's too smart uh, to be uh, to be deceived by this woman. So here is the second case, and then he went to an allot. 
Ah, uh, how is it that a man who was called of God, but announced of God, Seventh Day Adventist parents, a third generation, fifth, fourth generation Adventist, or so on? Uh, how is it that now is not just a woman that pleased him from Tirnath? I have had ministers, I have people who are respected say, oh, get me a Sunday woman because that woman is, uh, she's good, she's, she's nice, she cooks well, she does all things right, I, I love her, uh, except we don't worship with her. I mean, marriage is not an evangelistic campaign. We don't go into marriage to make calls to people. That is not marriage, my friend. We don't go into relationships to convert people. We enter into relationship so that by and by we can be like Jesus. But we don't go there to evangelize people. That is why it actually takes two converted people to make a successful marriage. It takes one to break it. It takes one to mess it. But it takes two to make an enjoyable, sanctified, holy, happy marriage. So he says, go get me that woman. But now he does not tell the husband. Do you see how sin is deceptive? So there is a first time that he goes to the parents, but now he does not go to the parents. He goes down to Gaza, to the house of that woman, a harlot. He feels he does not need the counsel of the parents. He feels he does not need the counsel of the church. He feels he does not need the counsel of the writings of Ellen White. He feels he does not need the counsel of the Bible. You see what young people do? You feel that I have grown beyond the counsel of the word of God, beyond the counsel of uh, the Bible, Ellen White's writings, pioneer writings, beyond the counsel of the church elders and church pastors, beyond the counsel of perhaps your parents. And I think God, you are ungodly. Uh, and so it goes down. And in verse 2 it says, and it was told the Gezite, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying in the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. The death of many men and women who are pious, who are in fire for Christ, has been actually uh, 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 has been discussed, has been actually um, made possible, spiritual death, while they were quoting the Delilahs of this time. It is at that time that Satan summons his angels. You went when you were sober. Oh, sir, you went for Bible study, and that's fine. Woman, you went there so that you'd be able to practice music. Oh, that's fine. But the truth is when you went there, the night was dawning, you knew you were only two or you were only pairs, the devil summoned his angels. Darkness enveloped that room. Darkness enveloped that place. And what happened? You began feeling that it's not really wrong for you people to maintain the uh, respectable distance between one another. You forgot that you are married. Or rather, you forgot that you have a girlfriend whom you are courting. And you are preparing for marriage. And you forgot that. So basically what happens in what we are seeing here is the moment Samson went in, the Philistines saw him. So the devil is not actually asleep. When we enter into places which God has not called us to be in, the devil doubles their presence there. Only angels withdraw their presence because they are sad. And what happens when they withdraw their presence? There is a plan 
on how to destroy you, how to destroy your ministry, how to destroy your life, how to destroy your purpose and the objective for which you are born. Are you listening to that youth? This is how many great men have been destroyed. Women, alcohol, money, or wealth. Women, wine, wealth. W, 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 dot. So these three actually brought together have been put so that they can destroy men who otherwise, if we remain faithful to the principles of God's word, would have not been destroyed. And the Bible says, Samson lay till midnight and arose at midday at the two posts and went away with them. You see how the devil is crafty. And the point is here, there are things that will keep us forgetting that we are moving away from God. They comfort us. Or rather, I would say we comfort ourselves sometimes with active part in church so that just that guilt could walk away. You see, I, I'm going to be the man. I, this could be your real life experience. This could be your real life experience. Or perhaps uh, I told you the story of um, I told you the story of the young youth who came to uh, an office where I was sitting uh, doing a week, and she was crying, and she was crying. Uh, because of some mistakes that happened. I mean, I was talking to a lady about 25. And at that time, I was about 27 or 28. And I'm talking to a lady about 25. We're there with the elders. I'm doing a week of prayer. And interesting is that the lady says, I've, I've, I've messed up my life. And I got married to an elder of the church. What made I get married to the elder of the church? I'll tell you why. This is what made her get married to the elder of the child. He was a mtumish. Did you hear that? You know, from that day, I walked out of the office and said, don't call me mtumish. I don't like the name. It has been so hugely abused that sometimes I fear, I would, I would rather you just call me Zado, brother. Um, I mean, the name, how do you call yourself a servant of God and beat your wife on the second day after marriage he just beaten his wife and this lady was in tears and she told me that one sabbath she was going to church and we, we were there in the office and she must have been in her normal cycle so she was a little bit unwell and she sat there and while she was entering the church the husband had already gone to church. He was the preacher. He didn't know. But the night before, they were just preparing to do devotion. Even evil people do devotion. Then the husband, the mtumishi, the elder, beat her with a pail of water because there are simple disagreement. And then the next Sabbath, the man was the preacher. He was carrying gates. <laughs> He was in the church bulletin. He was struggling to bring people to Christ when he could not actually bring his wife to Jesus by his character. You see, friends of Jesus, the gates that I'm talking about, when the devil gets hold of us, there are things the church might not know, the public might not know, but our struggles in our lives, in the lives of young people, in marriages, and yet no one wants to speak about them. This man was beating his wife, and no one knew it in the church. The pastor didn't know it until the lady began speaking, until the lady said, no, I'm not going to take it. In fact, recently we are dealing with a kid who is supposed to, um, of a very dear cousin of mine, an elder. And in this case, the very wife whom she married was putting a, a knife below the pillow. My auntie is a Christian. My uncle is a Christian. They brought up a man who was sober to my extent. But the man turned 
against the principles of God's word. And here was a woman putting a knife from the grinder under the pillow. What is it that Samson is doing here? Samson is digging his, the hole of spiritual death and death. He doesn't know that that's the end of it. But Satan has already made guys around. And so we can threaten the devil by cutting away gates. And that's okay. I mean, they say you just, you do that sin and you go to the pulpit and you're like, you're on fire. You do that sin, you go to the choir, you are doing the best soprano. You do that sin, you go and, and then after that, you feel like, man, I'm relieved. I'm never doing good. I'm telling you the truth. That's what gates, that's, that's the action that I think men are cutting gates. <laughs> they are busy cutting gates. They are busy fighting with lions. They are busy doing all these great things. And that looks good. But friends of Jesus, I tell you the truth. It is not our work. It is the works of men and women who are quickly being defeated by the devil. His work, the greatest work, was to resist passion. To resist an appeal of lust of the flesh, to resist the I mean I mean I mean the desires of, of, of the heart and to seek righteousness and holiness. This was the great work that he was supposed to be doing. Uh, interesting, he forgets his work and thinks about if I do this and do that and do that and do that, I'll be the greatest man. Man, I've come to the point where my main burden is I would be like Jesus. Have you come to that point where your greatest burden is, Lord, how can I be like Jesus? That's what I want us to think about tonight. How can I be like Jesus? And listen, I, I don't even want to go to, you all know this story because we were taught in children class how that story ended, how one time she lied to Delilah and Delilah peeled again and he lied, he lied and Delilah peeled again and he lied, but this final time, this final time. Listen to what Ellen White says. I want to read for you these quotes because time is over according to my time. I think Bro Steve's watch was a bit uh, behind. So we started from my watch here, from my computer, 15 minutes later. So Samson in his peril at the same source of strength as at Joseph. Did you hear that? We are leading from a science of the times, October 13, 1881. No one had a greater privilege between Samson and Joseph. All of them equal availability of strength and power. Just imagine Samson, a man who was brought up to actually deliver Israel is now the man who is in the bondage of Israel without his two physical eyes. He's weaker than the weakest man. What can you do without your eyes? What can you do in the temple of Dagon, serving, grinding maize, and doing all these funny things? And, and that's where we are when we choose to play cards with the devil. Young people, we will be going, I think next week or hopefully, into steps into marriage. But we need to understand, for us to appreciate those steps, we must begin by appreciating that if we don't erect barriers against the deceptions of Satan, the loopholes that Satan is using to overcome young people, we cannot appreciate the things of God. And so that's why you'll tell some young people that God is calling us into a life that is holy, they say, uh, no, I don't think that, that, that that's going to work. You'll tell some people God is asking us to share our account status in marriage. They say, oh, no, 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 I can't tell my wife about my money. Yeah, she can run away. Yeah, you tell her that, hey, you know, uh, God is calling us to be able to, the, these things will not be appealing to their mind. Why? Because to them, spiritual things have no place. They have educated themselves in a way that the lust of the flesh overrules. 
the frontal lobe. Listen to what Ellen White says. They all add the same access to power, strength. He could, Samson, choose the right or wrong as he pleased. But instead of taking hold of the strength of God, he permitted the wild passion of his nature to have full sway. The reasoning powers were perverted. The morals were corrupted. God had called Samson to a position of great responsibility, honor, and usefulness. But he must first learn to govern by first learning to obey the laws. Joseph was a free moral agent. He chose the right way and God approved. Samson, under similar temptations, which he had brought upon himself, gave loose rein to passion. The path which he entered upon, he found to end in shame, disaster, and death. What a contrast to the history of Joseph. Man, the, we just begin by breaking those strongholds, and there we are. You take a, a chat with a sister, and she calls you dear, and you don't blush. You don't, you don't fear. I mean, uh, I will be careful, and th there's no problem. Uh, if, 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 if you write a text to me yeah, and use the word dear, praise the Lord. It, Dear father, dear brother, dear sister, well, praise the Lord. Uh, but if you just say dear, uh, I've, I've, I've got to put questions to be sure that you add the word brother there. So that because that word can be used in different ways, depending on how you use it. When my wife uses the word dear, it's different to me the way you use it. So I want us to be sure that there are certain things that we take lightly. But they break the strongholds. They break those strong, they don't break those barriers. They break those principles. And and then yeah, you begin to forget uh, about what God is calling you uh, uh, into doing. Listen to this. Uh, Ellen White continues says the youths of today can bless or blight their future life. God calls young men in the strength and glory of their manhood to do service for him. But many who God could use refuse to obey. They decide to secure worldly gain and worldly honor. To become a servant of Christ, they consider as requiring a great sacrifice. The history of Samson conveys a lesson for those whose characters are yet unformed, who have not yet entered upon the stage of active life. The youth who enter our schools and colleges will find there every class of mind. If they desire sport and folly, if they seek to shun the good and unite the evil, they have the opportunity. Sin and righteousness are before them, and they are to choose for themselves. But let them remember that whatsoever man soweth, the same shall he reap. And you see, after the devil has used you, it dumps you. What did he do to the prodigal son? He used the prodigal son. He excited the prodigal son. And he went and took of his flesh. And then he went and the Bible said he wasted his substance. Have you read that statement with me? Wasting his substance? That's big. It's not like he wasted his man. He wasted who he was. He was not ever been a honorable person. When the devil has used you, no one will even tell you you are pretty. If a man tells you you're sexy, oh, well, we're going to put question marks, dear lady. You see, when the devil has used you, the devil dumps you. He dumps you, and that's what is here with the case of, of Samson. Samson is dumped. I mean, in the end of the story, the devil has no business with him. He's overcome. He can no longer be a deliverer of Israel. His purpose and his office and his work and his objective is all failed. And why is it failed? For a man who was born of God, by announcement by an angel. How many people in that village had their birth announced by an angel? I don't even think my son Joseph did. I mean, I have to confess. No angel came to me and told me that I'm going to give birth. Uh, I mean, but we're going to have a son. No angel came. And I can tell you, it, it perhaps was one case after many years. 
that had this father, like, you will have a son. And here is the man who now the devil has messed so much that is a disgrace to parents and disgrace to society and disgrace to the church a disgrace to everyone because it's now in the mire of pigs eating garbage with pigs. And this is what is happening to many young people who once were pious, who are brought up as pathfinders, who are brought up as youth. What happened? It's because they did not raise barriers. They were not told to give their hearts to Jesus. And if we don't if we get involved in this mechanics of religion and we don't give our hearts to Jesus, we are going to bring ourselves to a place where our excitement will not be a relationship with Jesus, our excitement will be the mechanics. And this is why many choir groups, I'm sorry to mention this, and I'm trying to be very courteous and very polite, many choir groups are immoral. But they carry those gates of new videos and uh, launch. Those are the gates we carry. Let them see, we are working. We are so and so ministers. We are so and so ministers. Many ministers. And I'm not even talking about even in the ministry of preaching, even in the ministry of relieving the poor, even in the ministry of whatever ministry God has called you into. We are sometimes too much into the externals and we are rotting away secretly. We must come to a point where, like Joseph, we must have a living relationship with Jesus. Anything that will save us today and in our life in the future, should we get into marriage before Jesus Christ comes, is this, a living relationship with Jesus. Those who have not learned to love Jesus enough cannot love a man or a woman. Perfectly. That perfect love that the Bible talks about begins by agape love. That love which expects no return. I know many of us young people who are here. I know we are also here with elderly people who are helping me to appreciate these truths. That woman you love, because of her body, I'm here to tell you, that body is not going to be the same in 20, 30 years, in your eyes, physically. To Christians, that woman is still going to be the same, beautiful woman. Are you still going to tell your wife you are beautiful, and your wife is going to tell you your answer? You're going to lose all and we'll talk about the marriage vows and how it works. You see, you take those marriage vows and you forget that, hey, buddy, that woman could get an accident tomorrow. She could be blind tomorrow. She could be crippled tomorrow. I could be put in a position to wipe that woman every day because of disease and sickness. Is she still going to be that woman that I promised I will love? Till that do us part. I, 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 I was talking to a minister and we were just talking not far away and he said, we have had a problem with an elder and the problem is the moment his wife got sick and he was like, she's going to die. She began quoting another woman. How, how disgraceful is that to the wife who is sick? She thinks about the vows you made and how unfaithful you have been to those vows. And many of us think that uh, we can be involved in the mechanics. The problem is the mechanics. When we let Christ go before us, when we let those principles of the Bible encourage us and constrain us, we will not have problems with these things. We will never have problems. Your wife can get old, she's still that beautiful woman. Oh yes, my friend, you, you can be... Uh, Unaeza parara ile yako yote. Wanako bada atakupenda. I'm not saying you be shoddy, you be all these things. No, 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 no. But the thing is this. If you love that woman only when she gets to dress up 
for a date and come and meet you. You don't love her when you get her in the farm. What do you do if you get her in the farm? Doing a farm work? Doing her utensils? What do you do? Will you love the same woman? That's the question I'm asking you. Will you love the same woman? And this is why our ladies are make up and into all these things. They want to provide a fair, uh, another look of who they are like, but that's not really them, right? Listen carefully to what Ellen White says. I'm spending quite a bit of your time. I want to finish this so that you go sleep. The history of Samson conveys a lesson. For those whose characters are yet unformed, who have not yet entered upon the stage of active life, the youth who enter are... Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's not that's not the one. Samson, that mighty man of valor, was under solemn vow to be a Nazarite during the period of his life, but becoming infatuated by the charms of a lewd woman, he rashly broke that sacred pledge. Saturn worked through his agents to destroy this ruler of Israel, that the mysterious power which is possessed might no longer intimidate the enemies of God's people. It was the influence of this bold woman that separated him from God. He was separated from God. Our artifices that prove his real. The love and service which God claimed Samson gave to his, this woman. And that's why when we get into the mechanics of uh, these things, we forget the love of the service of God. We give it to man. No more devotion. No more prayer. If you realize that a relationship is endangering your prayer life, endangering your study life, endangering your relationship with God, question marks. The earlier you break that engagement, the better for you. And we'll talk about that. The earlier you break that engagement, the better for you. If you realize you are struggling to keep, to, to prove to us that you're a Christian when you are having issues, man, the earlier you break that engagement, the better for you. If you realize that this woman is Delilah, or this man is the Delilah, because men can also be mess. In fact, men are mess. I've just given you a good example. To our dear, lovely ladies. Get off. Get off. Because the moment you enter in, the men of Philistine are there. The agent. All right. So he lost all sense of sacred conscience, passion. And then I say, stars at the time above all others when we should have maintained entire consecration to the will of God, just as it was entering upon the stage of manhood, the period when he must execute his divine mission at this critical point in his life history, Samson yielded to the temper and by unwise marriage placed himself in alliance with the enemies of God. This important step was not only carefully considered. Samson did not ask himself whether he could better glorify God when united with the object of his fancy or whether he was placing himself in a position where he could not fulfill the purpose to be accomplished by his life. To all who seek first to honor him, God has promised wisdom, but there is no promise to those who desire only to please themselves. If you desire only to please yourself, there is no promise of God's blessing upon that life. Oh, friends of Jesus, I want to pray with you today. I want to pray with you knowing that you are deciding. Physically, Samson was the strongest man upon the earth. But in self-control, integrity and firmness, he was one of the weakest men. Many mistake strong passions for strong character. But the truth is that he who is mastered by his passions is a weak man. The real greatness of a man is measured by the power of the feelings that he controls, not by the feelings that controls him. God was with Joseph in his new home. He was in the path of duty, suffering wrong, but not doing wrong. He therefore had the love and protection of God, for he carried his religious principles with him everywhere. What a difference there in the life 
of Joseph. We are told Joseph suffered for righteousness sake while the trials of others are of their own procuring. The Lord prospered Joseph, but in the midst of his prosperity came the darkest adversity. The wife of this master was a licentious woman. That the eye of God was upon him, few temptations are more dangerous or more fatal to young men than the temptations of sensuality and none, if yielded to, will prove so decidedly ruinous to the soul and body for time and eternity. The welfare of the entire future was suspended upon the decision of a moment. Joseph calmly cast his eyes to heaven for air, slipped off his loose outer garment, leaving it in the hand of his tempter. And while his eye was lightened with determined resolve in the place of an holy passion, he exclaimed, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It is better to run naked than to sin before God. Joseph was ready, my friends, he was ready to let people call him that coward, useless young man. You better choose that straight path where men and women, your fellow youths can think that you are not worth. You are, you are not a man. You are weak. Uh, you, you are all these things. Let them call you that. And that's fine. Just stay true to principles and God will bless you. Just stay true to principles and God will bless you. Let's pray uh, as, we, as we end. Holy Father in heaven, we realize that true strength comes from you. The best of our doings, the best of our mechanics the best of the works of our hands cannot approve us before you they are filthy rags we want that robe that only jesus can give us his robe of righteousness we are way into the night and lord we are going to sleep and gross our minds with a beautiful thought that Christ is our righteousness. And we claim that righteousness which he alone can give us, that we may be able to overcome the attempts of the devil to have us sleep and waste our youth. Help every single youth, every single family, every single man, that is seeking, Lord, to better be prepared to be of service to you in their youth, in their family. Restore our families that are torn. Restore our relationships, our hearts that are broken. Restore that little girl, that man, that woman, whatever it is that is feeling so disappointed. This night, start a new life with us. It's our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.